um, Mike Sherrod. I've been uh, with Heritage for a few years. And as I was sharing before we started, I am a mother of three kiddos. I've been teaching since 2000. I started teaching for the Los Angeles Unified School District. And I've been teaching online since 2012. So it is just really fascinating to see the evolution of the K-12 space moving online. Um, and I think that there is, you know, a lot of good things that can come out of it. You know, I think challenge is, is hard. Doing things differently when you don't really have a choice is really hard. And trying to manage it all when you have other responsibilities makes it feel very overwhelming and almost impossible. But uh, I'm reminding you all today to give yourself some grace and you got this, okay? Take small bites, start with a few tech tools. Um, remember to put the onus of learning into the hands of your students. Let them be the leaders, let them be the teachers, let them um, show you what they know. This is the YouTube generation and they will eat it up and do amazing things if you just trust in their ability to do so. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some distance learning and we're also gonna wrap that around the concept of grit. So let's get started. And I will just share my presentation with you guys and I believe um, Mike is going to also share um, my presentation. So let me just get started and you'll have access to all of these resources that I'm sharing with you guys today. I do have a YouTube channel because I have three kids and they love YouTube. <laughs> and they definitely, if you have kiddos, you probably have heard them ask you, mom, can I make a YouTube channel? Um, so it's fun. Video is fun. I have actually had to do a really complex task for um, one of my jobs last week and I couldn't understand the directions. And one of our millennial staffers made a video and in one minute I got the task and was able to complete what I needed to do and move on. So there is a lot of power in video. So I encourage you guys um, to just start getting into that mindset and practice. It's great to curate videos, but when it comes to building relationships with your students, they need to see you. They need to hear you. They need to feel you. And that's how those relationships happen. Um, like I said, I've been teaching online since 2012. And even though students don't always take a class with me because, you know, I have like one class and six sections of it, I get emails from my students all the time and they're like, oh, wow, I feel like I know you because I've seen your videos and yet they've never taken a class with me. So it's a really powerful tool and we'll um, get a little bit into that and definitely reach out to me, you guys, if you have any questions or you wanna know how do I do this, how to do that, I'll be happy to share um, any resources I have with you and tips. So when we talk about grit, okay, just do a quick sketch in your head in, on a piece of paper. Draw a picture that represents what grit is and what grit is not. Nancy, Nancy Fisher, can you share what you drew? You want to just show your picture and just put it up to the screen like this so we can see it. Yeah. Okay. So I drew uh, a little like smiley face, but he's got sweat coming down and it says, yes, I can. So that's right. grit to me. Yeah. So it's a lot of sweat, right? Yep. I think Einstein said that 99% um, perspiration, 1% genius. So you got to put right. that hard work in there, right? To make it happen. Yes. All right. So um, grit was actually coined by a professor, uh, excuse me, Angela Duxworth, who is out of the University of Pennsylvania, building on the concept of growth mindset that you probably have all it's been around for some time, came out of Stanford from Carol Dwork. And if you're a math teacher, you're probably familiar with Joe Bowler's work in the area of U cubed. She's awesome too. Well, I really love Lila Stingeris. She is also an author. She wrote Grit in the Classroom. If you are a middle school teacher, I would highly recommend this book. She writes it from the lens of teaching middle school. And um, if you click on her picture later on, I actually reached out to Lila and asked her if I could do an interview with her so you can listen to all the things that she shares, all the best practices on my podcast. 
Um, but she also has a new book coming out about parenting and grit. And Lila kind of piggybacked on the work of Angela and just kind of framed it into the classroom and what it looks like for teaching and learning. And so there are really three components, passion, perseverance, and commitment. So as a classroom teacher, we need to kind of evoke that passion in our, in our learners, right? We need to get them passionate about what's happening. And then from there, we can build in perseverance. So when they want to give up and they have a challenging task, how do we get them to persevere? And then making that commitment through practice and structure and routines, all those things that you guys remember learning about, classroom management 101, right? Without all those things in place, you really can't have a well-run classroom. And so kids really aren't in that, they don't have the, the skill set to self-regulate. So we have to provide those structures for them so they can move in each of those areas. So Angela Duxworth said, grit is like live, is living life like a marathon. It is not a sprint, right? Any of you out there have actually run a marathon in your life? You can raise your hand. I've been to the Boston Marathon twice and I'm training for my third. <laughs> oh my goodness. Wow. I'm from Boston. So that resonates with me, Nancy. I'm big. I grew up watching the Boston Marathon my whole life. Nice. It's, That's awesome. It, it, yeah. It's a lot of commitment and energy and just having like nancy was saying you're training it's a schedule it's routine there's times where you want to give up times where you you just feel like you can't do this but you persevere and a lot of times i've actually ran a marathon myself believe it or not i quit smoking i trained for a marathon because i was like so over it i was in my 20s i picked it up in college i just wanted to quit so i decided to join a group to train for running a marathon and it was kind of that group energy for me because I was never like a runner that got me through all of that tough times and got me to persevere. So when you're thinking about designing these learning experiences, it's not just designing for one. You think about all your learners and what they need. Some kids need that group space. So whether you're designing a project online and having them work online, other kids need that one-on-one -on -one coaching and feedback. Some kids need a highly structured um, space so that they can kind of help them self-regulate, move forward. Other kids need voice and choice. So there's a lot of different strategies that you have to kind of think about when you are designing these spaces for your learners. So in a nutshell, grit is not giving up when you want to and sticking with your goals no matter the challenges you face, right? Here's an example of my kiddo trying to learn a trick on a skateboard. It's a lot of falling, there's a lot of failure, there's injuries, sometimes there's a little bit of blood and pain. I think if you guys are parents out there, you remember the first time your toddler ran and fell and your immediate response is like, man, I just gotta rush over there and just like be there for my child. But my third kid, I was like, okay, she's got this. I can step back and she will be okay. I didn't, it took me three kids to realize I was actually exacerbating the problems and creating these mindsets of like you can't do this you don't got this because I was like right in there to rush in and help so here's an example of grit with my kids during the age of distance learning um, my daughter who's in first grade she um, had some math worksheets and it was on different three-dimensional shapes. Well, one of them was a sphere and nobody in my house knew what a sphere was. So I said, I'm going to get gritty with this. And we created our own Ed Puzzle. Um, anybody out there using Ed Puzzle? Raise your hand. It's a phenomenal tool. It allows you to create or curate videos. So any video that you have, whether it's like a math antics video, a phonics video, um, it could be a video of yourself. So think about having a flipped classroom model where you're creating a video. And then what you do is once you've create your video, you can upload it to this Edpuzzle tool. And then see these little dots here at the bottom of the screen, right here underneath the video image I shared with you guys. Those are all questions that I've put into my video to check for my students' understanding. So think about a formative assessment and this came out of the fact my son had to watch a video also on dissecting a cow eyeball. He's in sixth grade. 
and he was just scrolling along, scrolling along. And I was like, there has to be a way that we can make sure that these kids are actually getting this content and we're checking in with them and make sure that they get it and they're engaged. So we'll just watch this if I can load it on here. Oh, I can't. Um, but just to further on this tool, and there's a link you guys can actually watch my video that I create and we do these little images, we show the different shapes and then the kids have to guess what the name of the, um, the shape is. But you can, as I shared, you can curate any videos online from all of these websites. So even if you have a Khan Academy video, which kids, by the way, typically find very boring, um, you can slice and dice it. Maybe there's some really good pieces in there that your kids need to watch. Um, you can slice and dice it by adding in a question. You can even put yourself in there and say, hey guys, we just watched how Khan explained quadratic equations, what questions do you have? Or now that you've gone through this example, what do you think um, you know, about this concept? So you can add either open-ended or multiple choice questions. And again, this tool is gonna work with all of these different platforms. So grit is not determined by your IQ level and your previous achievements. Your I can is more important than your IQ. So um, it's really about that mindset, like you said, running a marathon, you know, like I can quit smoking, you guys. I actually did it, even though I knew I had a problem. <laughs> so how do we change that mindset in our students, right? It's a lot of self-talk. There's a lot of group effort. There's a lot of, you know, structure and just kind of rewards and behavioral um, contingencies that help build in that I can. So it's not going to be easy, just like distance learning is not easy, right? You've got kids all across. Some of them don't have the tools that they need, but we can't give up and we can't be compliant. We have to keep pushing forward and challenging ourselves to incorporate and use the technology and to make these connections with their learners. So here's an example of what grit is not, right? So Singuris in her book says, perseverance is not to be confused with compliance. Students who complete their assignments out of compliance are not going to become gritty. They aren't developing a passion and they won't persevere when things get tough, right? So you probably have kids that are A students and they might even front load that at the beginning of the school year and say, just so you know, I have a 4.0 GPA and I've always been an A student. And then after their test, they might come up to you and say, I really need to get an A. So obviously they're telling you like that most important thing to them is the grade. It's not actually the learning or the change that happens when they're growing and being challenged. So it's a really important for us to kind of wrap our head around is that compliance is not perseverance. We have to be intentional in our practice in ways that we can teach kids how to persevere. So here's some top 10 ways to get gritty with lots of things. This is me over 20 years ago. Grit is personal. I started teaching in South Los Angeles. Um, it was a challenge. I, I think my first day I came in with a yoga mat and a lava lamp because that's what I thought I was going to be doing every day. <laughs> and so remember, Remember your first years of teaching and how you persevered and overcome all of those challenges, right? This is kind of like the first year again, okay? You don't give up. You keep challenging yourself. You do what you need to do, whether it's like, I remember my mentor teacher gave me a book of 365 quotes, and I read one every single day to just build my own mindset that I can do it. So make this a personal journey. Share your stories about how you persevered as well with your students. Grid is modeled. So it's important for us to also share models of grid in your life. This is my grandmother. She's 92 years old. And, um, you know, she's seen a lot. She's gone through a lot. Remember to tap into stories of people in your life. Have your students tap into stories of people that they um, have in their families to to kind of connect with these stories so that they can persevere through challenging times. 
Also share some real examples. Everyone knows the story of J.K. Rowling, Michael Jordan. He was booted from his high school basketball team. And that's Bethany, who is a surfer, and she lost her arm from a shark attack and still continued on with surfing and becoming a accomplished surfer. Grit is also personal. This is, uh, we went back east last summer to visit my mom. She had this wallpaper on her wall from like 40 years ago. <laughs> I said, we're gonna do this. We are going to take this wallpaper off. So try to create experiences with your kids and online, whether it's you know building something, creating something, doing something, constructing something. It has to be a lived experience. And that builds into this philosophy of experiential learning, which is hands-on, it's active, kids learn by doing. So even though we're working with technology and we wanna incorporate all of these digital tools, which are fun and fascinating, you also have to provide experiences for kids to go on nature walks, um, you know, do something, have a passion project. And I'll share those templates with you guys incorporate things like genius hours so that they can build in their own perseverance and think about things that they want to develop and then provide the tools and resources and structures for them to to create those things and to have something that they can bring back and show with their with their um with their classmates so here is the after of the room doesn't it look phenomenal my mom was super stoked and the kids did it. So it's, it becomes something, if you think back of your own experiences in your life, these are the things that you remember. It's not, oh, oh when you look back in your, oh, I remember that we did, um, you know, a time test every day for 20 minutes or, you know, it's things that the, they actually kids experience. I remember my teacher coming in and playing the guitar after she actually, this was in fourth grade, I will never, never forget you guys. She was going through cancer and she came in and she had a wig on and she told us all about her, her um, battle with cancer, but she came in and she played the guitar every day and she was still there for us. And I kid you not, when I was going through hard times in my life, in my twenties, um, you know, I was the first person in my family to graduate. I told you guys that I, used to smoke cigarettes. I grew up in a high poverty area in Boston. I remember that teacher. I remember what she experienced in her difficult challenges. And I was like, if Miss Santa Maria can get through cancer and everything that she experienced, I can get through this challenge. I can persevere. So remember that because you are really forming. The brain is still forming. We're working with kiddos that are learning and their brain is forming. So those experiences that you share with them is gonna help them. It helped me, and I'm sure a lot of you guys can also share your experiences where you had teachers that they shared those experiences and they helped you while you moved into adulthood. So grit is believed, right? This is kind of building on that idea of growth mindset that I already talked about, but think about this when you're starting to work with your kiddos and think about the statements that they're saying because that will help you determine those mindset that your students have. And once you know what kind of mindset they have, then you can be like a doctor and prescribe certain interventions for your class, whether it's self-talk, whether it's a daily morning meditation or routine to help them move that mindset that they've adopted, they've already have walking into your classroom. So our beliefs influence our outcomes. You guys already know that. I was really interested, you know, I work in the area of teacher education, but Linda Darling Hammond, if you haven't heard from about her, she's out of Stanford as well. She's been in the area of teacher education for her entire career. Her research really much like the big thing about teacher that she's found in all of her years of doing research is that the best predictor of a, of a child's performance and their academic achievement in the classroom is the teacher's belief in them. So you guys are really the music makers in the classroom. Your belief about your students will influence how they do, okay? It might be a lot more nudging and personal phone calls and connections that you need to make during the time of distance learning. And it's, you know, certainly gonna be a, a lot more time in front of the screen, 
but you can make it happen. You can make those kids feel seen, heard, appreciated, loved, send them letters, you know, before the school year starts, write them a letter, send it in the mail, introduce yourself, do a video, you know, front load that, um, what your expectations are with the parents, send them a newsletter, let them know how you're going to be communicating with them. And I'm not sure where we are with time, but, um, this is a quick video from Will Smith about grit and motivation. And I'm just going to share it for the sake of time. But I want you guys to know that when you are going through this presentation, at the link at the bottom of this um, slide here with Will Smith is an entire Padlet. If you haven't used Padlet, it's basically a board where you can add different images and links. This is an entire link to about 30 different motivational videos that I've curated as part of the Grit in the Classroom course. So um, just encourage you guys to kind of share those videos with your, with your students to get them motivated. Again, I talked about the importance of fostering collaboration and what that looks like and why it's important. Some kids are, you know, definitely, I have three kids, they're very different. They need that social interaction with their, with their peers. To, to really build that motivation. And again, the positive self-talk. So if you start hearing these messages in your classroom, think about how you can, you know, you want to spend time doing this stuff, right? Your first few weeks shouldn't be about just content, but about shifting that mindset of your learners, building those relationships, you know, and when it comes to technology, um, you want to make sure that the technology is not heavily content embedded, but it could be a fun kahoot. It could be a poplet where they're writing about themselves. It could be a quizzy where they're just, you know, playing a game about what they did over the summer. So you want to make it light and fun and engaging, and then you build in the content level um, curriculum once they've got oriented to these different technology tools. So um, be a coach, be a cheerleader, support your learners. And there's certainly a lot of research on the importance of um, specific measurable uh, feedback and how it helps students in terms of motivation and overcoming challenges and adopting a growth mindset. Oops. All right. I talked a little bit about the importance of building grit with kids, but you also, especially in the area of distance learning, here's an example of two newsletters that you can share with your parents. So you also want to make sure that you're kind of training the trainer, right? You want to shift your role because you guys are really teacher trainers now. You're training the parents to also support their kids at home. So whether you do a newsletter, or a weekly email and you talk about your learning objectives with the video, help set the stage, um, and teach them about grit. So help parents know what to do when they become frustrated with their kids, when their kids want to give up, and what that really means and what it looks like. So this is an example of a hyperdoc, um, and there is a link to creating a hyperdoc if you're not familiar with that. But again, as I talked about, grit is something that's developed, it's experienced. So you need to create a space for your kids to have some choice and autonomy. Passion projects. Um, this video really talks about kids sharing their passion and you know, giving them choice as the middle schooler talking about her passion um, in the area of uh, gun control and why she thinks it's important to have gun control and legislation. So if you're working with secondary students, giving them an opportunity to talk about some of these current events and build it into a passion project that they can share their knowledge, expertise, and insight with their, um, their classmates. Uh, here's an example of a Google slide deck that you guys can use. It's a battle research project. So just a good example of how you would structure a um, online learning project. Uh, if you don't have a Bitmoji, obviously you guys have seen my Bitmoji several times. I do have a video on how to create and use Bitmoji in the classroom. It's really easy. It's included in this presentation. 
again, it just creates kind of like a space of like, oh, there's my teacher. She's a cute little ca cartoon character. And um, you can set the stage for what you want your students to do. So in this presentation, they're creating an infographic on a Civil War battle that they're studying. Here's another example. If you're an ELA teacher, this one's on theme. And I've also shared this presentation with you guys. It's a Google slide deck that's interactive. So as the students are making, if you haven't done Google Slides, there's a video on that. Um, but what you'll do is you'll share your slide deck and then the kids will just work in the slide deck on a particular topic. And as you can see, just like this presentation, you have the content that's embedded and then the kids just answer the questions in the little boxes there. All right, so here's kind of, Another way that you can build grid in, in a distance learning platform, this is for my math class with my kiddos, my early learners. Um, they have a morning Jamboard where they check in and if Jamboard is like Google, uh, it's like Padlet. And then when they click on it, I'm not sure how much time I have if we have time to go through this. Um, but they're, all of these hyperlinks is what they need to do in their daily agenda. And there is a video here on how you can make a virtual classroom like this. These are all interactive um, images that are virtual manipulatives for the students to use. So feel free to check this out as well. And make sure that you are intentional with grit in terms of setting goals and reflecting. These are just two examples of a um, template that I created so the students can set goals. It's important to set goals at the beginning of the school year and then provide an opportunity. So whether you're teaching early learners, I mean, I, when I was teaching first grade, we would set goals about um, our reading fluency and our, our math computation skills that we wanted to acquire and then providing points for kids to check in throughout the school year okay, you know, at the beginning of the school year, I was reading 15 words a minute. Now, after two weeks, I'm reading 30. What, did I, what have I been doing? Oh, I've been reading every day. I've been reading for 20 minutes. And so even though that seems like, yeah, that's common sense, kids need to reflect. We do it intentionally because we're adults, our brains are developed, but we need to also, we need to scaffold that for our learners because kids don't do that intentionally and that's how they learn. So, right, I mean, when, when you have a conflict in your classroom and you have the kids reflect and think about their actions, then they learn from those mistakes. But we also need to set that type of intention when we're teaching our learners. We need them to reflect on what they did, right? And it helps build a growth mindset. Yes, I failed the test because I didn't study or I didn't look at my notes, or maybe I did study and this is how I did it. So provide opportunities for your kids to also share those strategies with their classmates <clears throat> so they can be intentional in what they're doing. All right. Here's another example of a project. This one is for math. It was a project-based activity and the kids had to pick a campsite. They had to, they got to pick a car, which was really fun for them. Um, they got, to, I think somebody wanted to pick like a Lamborghini and then this student actually was a little bit more, you actually learn a lot about your students when you give them projects. I'm like, oh, this student was very practical, right? You know, they took their mom's Toyota Tacoma instead of renting a Lamborghini. And then they had to calculate how much gas and mileage they would spend based on the distance. So this dude just took a screenshot with Google Maps and I provided the table for them because we were learning about ratios and they had to figure out how many um, miles per gallon and how much the cost would be. Uh, here's an example of building on that project because they were going on a camping trip. They had to build their own tent using the virtual graph paper. So you can see I gave the step-by-step -step instructions. Now you can even include a video here because some of your kids might need to actually see it and some of them might be able to just read it and do it but i always err on the side of the more modeling i can do the more successful my kids are going to be and the, in terms of creating a video if you can't synthesize what you want them to do in five minutes then you're talking too much it's too long because you've lost their attention 
So you want to try to keep your videos to five minutes. And honestly, that's going to help you also in terms of chunking the task. If the task is a 20 minute video, it's way too long and you've already lost her attention. So think about how you can break apart a task like finding the surface area with virtual graph paper and just do one chunk at a time. And maybe it's three slides with three videos. So here's um, three videos and three ways that you can engage your kids with virtual manipulatives in an online learning space. I love um, Bridges Math Learning Center and the left video is a how I'm modeling um, divide, division with manipulatives. And um, so with my students, they use a Google, Google Chrome screenshot. <clears throat> it's an app that they download through Chrome extension. And it looks like the little Chrome uh, triangle. <laughs> That's why I'm making the sign. And so what it does is just goes, if they're on a Chromebook, the extensions are key because they don't have any software. They can't download anything. So you have to teach them how to use Chrome extension and they'll just download the app. It goes right in their browser. So anytime they open up Google or whatever, um, you know, Google uh, or Safari or something like that, you'll see a whole list of tools that are right in the browser. So this is one of my favorites. The other one is Screencastify, and that's another free tool, or Loom, so they can create their own videos. And you can see in the right-hand side a video of my student um, making an array using Google Slides. So he's moving the cars into the parking lot, which is actually a great example of an array in real life with cars in a parking lot and there's two rows of six and then some kids might say it's two plus two plus two plus two plus two. Another kid might say it's two rows of six, two times six. So creating open-ended tasks, which I talk about in the um, virtual math class, is how you can reach and meet all learners. The more closed-ended your math tasks are, the more um, you're only creating a task for one student and one kind of learner. So you want to create these tasks where all students can have access and they can show you what they know. 